uh, invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me, sit, looked after me in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in and needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. We shared a crazy, crazy vision with you guys last week. Uh, if you weren't here, uh, I would ask that you would really maybe go back and uh, listen or watch uh, that sermon, uh, because I just don't have time to keep pushing that story up here from the pulpit. Hopefully you're going to hear more stories and you're going to see and we're going to dream some things together. Uh, you could go to our website or our Facebook page. Uh, this is our website um, here, uh, picklechristian.com. You can find the sermons there. I don't know how well you can see that picture. Uh, it's one of our family pictures from a dinner we had, and that is you guys uh, wrestling each other. There's like uh, 40 or 80 of you guys. I can't count there. You can see that people are picking each other up and their head. It's just, I, I love that. I mean, seriously, if you even if you don't want to hear the sermon, and go to our website at pickerchristian.com and see that's literally the header. The first thing people see <laughs> about our church is that picture of you guys just being silly and loving on each other. And uh, it just does my heart just fantastic. It just says welcome with that picture. And uh, I just I love that about you guys. <laughs> Last week, I tried to kind of really explain uh, the heart and the vision um, and just really as this, of this place. I went through the kind of the history of what you guys have done well before I ever got here and uh, what we've done since I've been here and kind of nailed it down and, and kind of funneled it down to we love to build things here and, and we love to feed people here. And so I went over a, a good like 10 or 15 minutes of just all the awesome things that you guys do uh, as a family. I also walked through um, the prayers uh, and the growth and the hopes of the leadership team since I've been here and the things that we've been hoping for and dreaming for and feeling that, that God has really kind of shown us what we should be about as leaders. And some of the fancy words that, that we use um, is uh, spiritual formation that leads to needs adoption that then leads to spiritual formation. It's kind of like a you know two sides of one coin, a rolling ball or, or whatever. But basically what that means is as a leadership, we would love to talk to you about who God is and who you are and challenge you guys to kind of mix those stories together and to grow in your faith, to grow in his story, to grow in your spirit, to understand what your role in all this is and what all these things can happen. And as we do that, one of the things that's going to help you understand that spiritual side of you is to go out and actually have some needs adoption, to look at the things in your life where people are, are hurting or the people that are in your life that you can maybe reach out to and love on. And as you do that, that's kind of scary as you kind of want to help and do this needs adoption stuff. And then you're going to need God to, to love people and to help people and to do the things of whatever that need is. And you're going to rely on him through his spirit to let you love this group of people or serve this group of people or talk to this group of people. Go out there, which means you're going to be spiritually formed because now you're experiencing Jesus for yourself, right? Right. And the more you know Jesus, the more you're going to want to love your neighbor. <laughs> and it just keeps going. He shows you another need or another thing. And so you have this thing inside of you. This is part of how God works. You start to understand his story. You start to understand your story. You start to move forward with loving your neighbor as yourself or teaching people about how to really know who Jesus is and love who Jesus is and, and know themselves. That's kind of what this is all about. This isn't about us just coming together as a family and getting up here and hearing a really cool band and seeing a very handsome pastor preach to you guys on a regular basis, right? That's not what this is all about. And as we kind of roll through that moments, this is what we were kind of wanting to do. Case in point is before COVID, we were trying to get uh, different groups of the church to come together and have four or five families come together and start praying about what would be a courageous act of generosity. That they were already together, okay, forming this group. So let's, it's, I'm thinking of uh, um, Jeff's group. Uh, they were meeting together to study the Bible and get to know each other and care for one another. And we come alongside challenging them to not just have the spiritual formation, but to have the needs adoption. Who is somebody that you as a group could agree on to go and be with and serve and love on? And so they took a few months to talk about that. 
praying together and brainstorming together and trying to come up with ideas of, of who to serve and how to love these people. And they eventually settled on going to Moat Park and talking to the people who were already at Moat Park, the, the clubhouse, which is a school organization that meets with kids after school and they love on the kids for a couple hours, help them with their homework, teach them certain things. And they were going to go there, I think, on, on Thursdays at that point. I'm not really sure. Uh, was it Thursdays? Remember, and Wednesdays? Doesn't really matter to the story. But they were going to go. They just literally decided that they were going to go to the clubhouse every Thursday, and they were going to feed these kids, and they were going to feed their parents, and anybody who wanted to come down to Moat Park and have a meal. And literally a week later, COVID. Boom. <laughs> and it just shut us down, right? So when kind of COVID starts to open back up, and as a church, we're trying to think about what are we supposed to be doing? We went through that story last week and we thought, well, let's start feeding people. We already, see how God works? We already had a group of eight people or 10 people that were willing to say, we'll cook food once a week. They'd already agreed to do that, right? A couple of years ahead. God had already worked on their hearts. And so it was a kind of easier transition for us as a church to say, we're going to cook a meal on Wednesday nights and, and feed whoever shows up as they drive by and go through those things. But it's still a struggle. We don't know really where the money's coming from. We always have all the food. We don't know who's coming through. We never, ever have a count. Imagine that. Serving a meal, having no idea if you're going to have 50 people or 400 people, <laughs> and trying to have that balancing act. Every week is this, this moment of faith of like, when do we make more food? Do we have this much food? And we have no money for food, so we're just trying to you know, penny pinch wherever we can and do this. It's this dance that goes on, this faith. So in this needs adoption, the people that are involved in it every time have to have these these faith moments of like what are we doing <laughs> is this really working and so they have to have faith in each other faith in god that we're gonna have a food and almost every week we do and we've bought a few cards like if we've totally run out of food we have pizza cards and so if somebody drives up we can give them you know go get a pizza even if we don't have our food um, but it's this an ongoing process and i say all of that not to say look at those people but that's what i'm talking about some people came together to, to figure out Jesus and to be spiritually formed. They had this needs adoption, and that made them grow more in their faith and be spiritually formed. And so now we're trying to figure out how do we do that as a church? How do we move us as a, as a whole family into something along these lines? And so what we have come up with and we started to, to try to put out there for you guys is something that as a leadership we call the hub so I pray that you would go back. If you didn't hear last week's sermon, go back and listen to that. Because it's going to explain a lot of these things. But basically the dream that we have is to have this hub. And I always kind of look at it as the mall. All right, I know some of you younger folks maybe didn't love the mall or haven't been in a thriving mall. But you at least know what the mall is and where it is out there. All right? And the way a mall works is that you have some anchor stores, some really big stores. And so we had Sears and J.C. Penney's and, you know, Dick's out there and stuff. And those are the anchor stores that supposedly everybody wants to go to. And so while you're there at, at Sears and you're, you're looking at your, your, your equipment, you're looking at some pants, you're looking for a hammer or whatever you're doing at Sears, you might go into the rest of the mall. And so there's some other little shops in there, like an Annie Ann's. Like, I'm never going to go into the mall and not look for, like, a pretzel place, okay, or a cookie place. It's like what you do. The mall means cookie or something, right? And so you go get your pants at JCPenney's, and then you go get a cookie. It's a, another spot that's in there, another store that is in there. And then you also have little kiosks, right, that are in the middle of, of some smaller businesses or people who are just trying to get you some information about, you know, if you want to do a bathtub or a roof or, you know, make a drawing for a car or something. And I say that because that's kind of what we would like to do in town. Our churches are very disconnected. Our, our ministries, the nonprofits in town are very disconnected. They're all fighting for certain volunteers and for certain amounts of money, and they don't really talk to each other a lot of the different times. When I first got here, there was a ton of food places that were helping. Now there's not very many at all that are helping. And you look at our church and go, okay, we're really good at building things and really good at feeding things and people. And so what we think is that our J.C. Penney part of the mall is going to be the food kitchen, that we hope to have a food kitchen that we can serve people at, Right? And do the food but we need one or two other organizations to be those things and then we got to talk to them we're going to fill in all these different organizations so my dream ultimately when i pray about this and i think about this how are we going to love people and adopt people and their needs in our town 
is that if somebody is really hurting, they get fired from a job, they can't afford a car insurance anymore, it's been a few, few weeks, maybe even a, a few months, and they're about to get kicked out of their apartment, they could go to a place called The Hub, and when they show up there, they could get a meal. And they could find out while they're there getting a meal, there's another organization over there called Compequa, uh, Piqua Compassion Network who helps you find a job <laughs> or helps you find help for your electricity or your rent. There, there's another little kiosk thing sitting over here where they can get you a haircut for free so that you can look nice. And there's a little clothing store over here that's got some nicer clothes so that when they go to their job interview, they have a haircut and they have some clothes and their belly is full and they have the interview set up and somebody has taught them how to do a resume. And it started just because they were hungry. But there's that one spot where you can cross pollinate with other things and other people. And, and they had that one thing that transportation is a huge thing in our area. They can't get to Tip City to see this doctor and then Detroit to see this addiction thing. And then up here for a meal, they, did, they can't get that all in that spot. I mean, I'm doing pretty well and I'm already worried about gas prices. <laughs> I was just driving all over Miami County to get help. It's hard enough to ask for help, but to have to ask for help three or four times, most people won't do it. They're embarrassed. We have one place where all those things could come in to order. So what we decided was that we were just gonna keep praying. And for five or six years now, this stupid piece of property has been in our prayers. And this is that property on Weber and College. We shared that with you guys that it was for sale and I just want to say, I love you guys. I mean, we presented this to you and I threw up all this stuff on you guys and the price tag and things like that. And then we said, we're going to go down as a leadership and just pray because we don't know what the right thing to do with this is. And I didn't take a head count, but there were a ton of you there. A ton of you came with us and for us and prayed over this site. We had about four circles that went around. This is just one of those circles of people just sitting there and praying for a while. I mean, it was probably a good 10 or 15 minutes in that circle of just praying and seeking God's face and asking if this was the right thing. And there was three or four other groups like that doing the exact same thing. So much so the owner came out of the land because he's next, he's there with his shop and uh, got on the phone and started making phone calls. Who are these freaks? <laughs> he's like, why are there people on my property? Why are they circling up? What is this cult? What is happening? And so as people were got done, I was like, shooing on, hey, there's the guy. Okay, go, 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 get out of here. Because I didn't ask for permission because I'm an idiot, right? Because <laughs> uh, really, I, in my lack of faith, I thought, well, maybe there'll be 10 or 11 of us and we'll stand off to the side and, and that won't be a big deal. And, and in you guys and in your heart, I mean, we only had like 80 adults here last time and like 60 of you showed up. I mean, I, I just love that about you guys. During the week, we kept talking to some of you and answering phone calls and emails and going by people's houses all week because we asked to get the money for all of that. And the amount of money that we needed to get the land, you guys have already surpassed. Okay, we asked for 25,000 and as of right now, I think we have 28,000. I mean, that's insane for me to get up here. I don't ever talk about money from up here, ever. And I get at one time and say, guys, we're thinking about this psycho dream would you guys come along for this ride? We don't, <laughs> we don't have a lot of information. We have a love for our town and a desire to follow God and we can already buy the property. And that's because of your heartbeat. Now we have no real timeline for stuff, okay? Me and Jason went and tried to brainstorm a, a bunch of things and made phone calls. And I went down to the city, you know, twice to ask for their help about stuff. And I had to learn so many things that they don't teach you in Bible college about EPA regulations and uh, lawyers and all this craziness. I, I, this sermon is really terrible because I didn't have time to prepare it, okay? <laughs> I've been doing meetings and phone calls all week long. And so we're going to have to run some tests and we're going to have to do some different things. And so it's not really a done deal because that place has been a shoe factory. It's been an oven factory. There was one time where it was uh, just pouring detergent down into bottles and probably the land. And no one has ever done an EPA study there. And the concrete is about that thick. So one, it's going to be really expensive just to rip up the, the concrete. And then underneath it, who knows what the EPA is going to find. And so we have all kinds of outs, okay? We, we have put in an offer on that land 
They were asking 25,000. We said we would pay 20,000 for the land based on the uh, EPA results. So we have lots of outs in the next 90 days, okay? Because <laughs> if we come back, they're like, well, you got a half a million dollars just to get the, the stuff clean. We're like, we'll find another place, <laughs> okay? I don't know what that means. The important thing here is I just wanna say thank you. Your belief in the leadership, your, your passion for this town, your willingness to give so quickly says a lot about the health of this church. We didn't browbeat you. We didn't have all the elders come and sit on your couch and demand money. You know, I, I can't tell you as other churches I've been a part of that we're trying to do a building program and stuff. And this is kind of a building program. And I want you guys to hear this. This is not for us. This is not about our church building or doing anything. Every penny of that's going to this project, not to our church. We're not building a kid's wing. I'm not getting a raise. You know, this, this, is, this goes all to something that we think will benefit this city and the people who live here. We're actually losing money in this deal, okay? For last week, this week, and next week, all of the money that's given to the church for our church budget, we're just going to believe in faith, and we're giving it all to this project. So hopefully that's at least another probably 10 grand right there. And I hope I get paid. <laughs> I mean, that's where the leadership is. We believe in this, right? And so I don't know, I don't want to ever have to come up here and talk money and that kind of stuff. If you have questions about what we're doing, we would love to build a mall, <laughs> a nonprofit mall with 80 adults. <laughs> I mean, sometimes they can't build a mall with 80 investors <laughs> who are going to make money from what they do, right? So this, should, this does not make any sense, what we're trying to do. And it's going to be multiple years. This is nothing that we are going to hurry about. We're going to take our time and we're going to try our best to be really smart about it. But we need your all's constant prayers. Because remember who was up here with the students, the leaders that were praying for these kids? We're not that smart. <laughs> we just trust God for one more step in this process. So please keep praying for us as we try to do our best to figure all this out. And we're going to keep sharing this and sprinkling this out. Hopefully not a ton of money talk, right? We're just going to have faith in a lot of these things because we truly believe that God's going to just do that. So maybe it's something else from some other church is going to get involved or some other person is going to do something. I don't know what that is, but we just believe that something incredible is going to be going on. So to let you know, just in general, we have put out a bid, an offer on that land for 20000 We have 90 days to do all the tests and then figure out if that's something that once they tell us what we'll have to do, if we're willing to do that or not. So keep praying for us on that line. Does that make sense? Okay, if you have any questions about that, you can see me or Jason or any of the other leaders. Uh, we'll do our best to kind of go down that way. But we're doing this, I want to say once again, because we are for the city of Piqua. We are for the people of this area, right? This isn't anything, that, you're not going to see a new drum set up here. You're not going to see us redo the fellowship hall. You know, this is because we're trying to do something for them. And so that's what we've been talking about here, the storyboarding stuff. We have this week and next week for me to finally keep constantly pounding this picture into your head. We want you to come alongside of us as something that I've been calling the napkin story. Okay? I'm not going to put anything up there. There's one little picture in the corner uh, of one of the faces. Okay? Hopefully, if you've been around, you've seen this. This is a simple way to tell God's story on a napkin really quickly. And so I'm going to throw my daughter under the bus. Did she even come in here? Because she maybe was too afraid. Where's Brooke? Hey, there's Brooke. Okay, I threw her under the bus, and I'm going to have her see how much of this napkin story that she actually remembers. Now, I gave her a little bit of heads up, so hopefully she, like, went and found the answers, and I don't embarrass her too much. So give Brooke a hand. Woohoo! Okay, all right, so you want uh, blue or black? Going with the blue, going with the blue. What this is supposed to be is... A napkin, okay? But it has to be big enough for you guys to see it, right? And what I want you to do is that the Bible is full of crazy stories, and sometimes it's overwhelming. So 
So if you only have 30 seconds to five minutes to tell somebody God's story, do you have a tool that helps you remember that story and or that you could show them about the story? So there are seven faces, I'll give you that hint, and six words that you could write on a napkin. The floor is yours. Uh-oh. Yeah, as much as you do what you want to do. That'd be great. You're, yes, you are. I just chose her because if I just said, Randy, you're up, then he might kill me, okay? Uh, she might still kill me, but uh, she's still going to love me eventually because she's my child. Hey, this is Latisa's mic. Is this on? Hello? Oh, you can just yell. Sure, sure, sure. Never mind. Just yell. It is one of the words, yes. You're good, you're good. Congratulations, ma'am. That was so much better than I could have done. <laughs> all right, give her a hand for coming up here and trying, all right? Next week, I'm just going to go ahead and grab a random person, though, okay? So be prepared. It's a, it's a, it's a random thing. I'm looking at you, Charity Tune. <laughs> okay, now, this is, is correct. Now, uh, this, is, this one was one piece, that you're not there, you're not sad there, you're happy here. Okay, that's the one thing. That's incredible that you got that many things that were in that picture, right, as you do this. Now, what this is supposed to be, then, is a simple way for you to be able to tell people that this is a love story, right? We've been going over this for a long time, so I'm not going to do the, the long version again, okay? This is the quick version. Uh, we, I blew it up the first week and tried to explain it all. The second week, I tried to blow it up a little bit, but get really in-depth on the four. And then the third week, I tried to get blow it up here, and then you get really in-depth with the with. And then last week we had the, let's take a break because we got to figure out this building thing. Uh, and so we're here at the one of today and then next time we're going to do uh, the in, okay? But what we really want this to say is that do the people in your life even believe this, number one, that the Bible, that Christianity, the church, that Jesus, is this a love story? Because for a lot of the world, it doesn't feel like this is a love story. It was like a lot of condemnation. And so the first thing you want to talk about is how we have this spiritual being in the world who created the world, and he's not this mean dude who wants to break us and send us to hell. He's actually for us because he's love. He's love. And because he is love, he's creating this story to give it value and purpose and help and have citizens of kingdom. It's a beautiful love story. And so out of love, for part of it, he goes now and he starts to be with us. So this is kind of like the pre-creation and then Adam and Eve, you know, and he's kind of for them even in that moment. And he's always for people throughout this whole thing. It never stops. It's step one. Okay. But then he goes in, in the Old Testament now, he starts to be with people. And so he hops into a story for a day or two or a, 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 can, a chance meeting or one meal or later with the Israelites, he hops in for you know, to guide them with this giant fire on a mountain. He's with them. But when this stage, even though he's full of love, he's still justice. And he can't necessarily be with them like he is with us. And if any of us would actually have seen Mount Sinai, and you're sitting there at the base of the mountain, and you're looking up going, this is an impressive mountain, number one. 
But then there is this giant fire that sounds like an atomic bomb and a, and a train and a storm and tornadoes. And it's like, <laughs> and it says, come up here. You'd be like, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> and so God wants to be with us, but we're still kind of like, we're afraid. And God knows that. And so he hops into our story and hops out of the story. He hops into the story and he hops out of the story. But he loves us so much that he does not want this to continue. But he's full of justice and righteousness and holiness. And so something he does that no other God that you can hear about in this entire world then is that he changes himself. And he puts on a hat. And then dwells in flesh. Now, he still has his holiness. He still has his halo. But in the man of Jesus, he comes and he's going to be one of us. That makes us happy. At least the people that he was around. Okay? The people that he was around, their lives were changed. And you could go over story over story that when Jesus shows up, the person was never the same. Right? Because of his love for everybody. We're going to get a little bit more deeper in that today. But I'm not going to go crazy in my sermon today. Okay, because I spent all of December going over this. It wasn't in this, this section or this phase of one of. But if you remember at Christmas, the whole thing was about the presence of God being the best present we ever got. Him coming and being one of us gave us freedom. It gave us hope. It broke our strongholds. It broke our fears. Him being that one of. And so I'm not going to repeat that sermon today just to get this into your hearts because I spent five weeks on it in December. If you'd like to go back and hear that, I, I'll more to you. Okay, have the Day Fish Back podcast and listen to four hours of me babbling. Okay, but that was the one of. But that wasn't enough either because he loves us. And he can only be with so many people now that he's in the flesh. And so he leaves and he changes us into a new creation. And now he is in you. And he's in you. He's in you, and he's in you, and he's in you, and he's in you, and he's in you. And now we can go every place and extend the kingdom of God because the Holy Spirit is in us. We are a new creation. We're going to get more into that next week. But this is a love story of God wanting to get closer and closer and closer to everyone. Whether they believe in him, like him, obey him, want to spit in his face, want to put him on the cross... He is for every one of them. And now that we are in it, the biggest question that we've got to really ask ourselves, are we for everybody as well? Will we keep moving forward in all of this? This is the, I think, do I have the hand-drawn picture up there, Caleb? And that's it, okay? That's what we really kind of want to throw out to you and let you see. And, and you have to practice that. And I would say, seriously, we, we did three weeks of class uh, to kind of help people understand this, uh, and that's over now, but <laughs> go back and I would just practice this because it really, when I had this tool, it really helped me then put the story in my head. And as you walk through it, it's just a tool that helps you learn his story because you have a job now. Okay. This is not a love story to get you out of hell. That's a one-time event. Now we can talk about space time, whether it's an event that happened on the cross or whether it's an event that happened in your basement, or whether that's an event that happened in the baptistry, or, or that's an event that happens when we hear good and faithful servant, or whether that's an event that happens on Judgment Day, or whatever, okay? But the point is, once you are in Christ, you now have a part of the reconciliation process. You are dead, and now live for the ministry of reconciliation, which is a fancy word that kind of goes along like this. In 2 Corinthians, it says, so for now, uh, for, oh sorry, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. I don't look at you for what you look like, or what your skin color is, or what your sexual orientation is, or what you think about God, or what you think about the Republicans, or what you think. I don't think that way anymore. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled to us, 
or us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world, the world to himself in Christ, not people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled with God. Are you signing up for that? Now, your salvation is probably a done deal, okay? This is not about whether you get into heaven or hell. This is about the next phase of your life. Are you focused on helping the people around you, anybody that you come across, take one step a little closer to Christ? And that starts with you having this spirit about you that says, I don't know you, but I'm for you. That everybody you see should get a feeling about you that you are for them. And then you whittle that down. There's going to be people in your life that you're just going to be with. Whether you go to school, or whether you go to work, or whether you go bowling, or whether you go to a bar, or whether you go and whatever you're doing. You're going to go be with a group of people. They should also feel that for. But now you're with them. So you should actually be able to influence them a little bit more. Some of those people in some of those groups you're really going to hone into. Because you really like them. Or you're forced to go to school with them and sit next to them every day, <laughs> right? You have to use this machine at work, and that person is just always going to be there, so you're eventually going to be one of them, okay? Maybe you're going to be, you know, Brett's neighbor, God bless you, okay? You're going to be one of him and a little bit more in your life. And the goal is to get as many people to understand that God is for them and that loves them. But they're going to do that not by God coming down on a scary mountain or having an angel go before them. They're going to see Jesus Christ finally because you have influence on them. Are you taking that responsibility seriously? Or is it just, here's my bills, here's my job, my kids are still stupid, oh my God, life. Right? That's not going to change. <laughs> Your kids are always going to be crazy. You're always going to have bills. And life is always going to be hard. So when we walk around with a smile on our face, when we walk around with joy, with patience, with compassion, the rest of the world goes, I know his story. He should be broken. He's not. What's that about? And maybe somebody would ask you, why are you this way? You can say, got a napkin? Let me show you. And I want that for you. I want that so bad for you. And Jesus is never going to ask you to do something he hasn't already done himself. I want to pound that, pound that, pound that into you. It's not a God sitting up high going, you better do this and you better stop doing this. He came down and showed us the example. That was the whole thing. If you remember at Christmas time, I started my sermons off every single time with this poem. It says this. It says, The night Jesus entered the world changed everything. God was no longer a distant, unapproachable God that we could only hope to draw near to. He was now present among us in the person of Jesus Christ. God is now walking with his creation and living in the heart of his children. This is how we know that no matter what happens in our lives, we can count on God's presence because Christ now lives in us. Do you believe that story? Or is this something you do because you're a Christian and that's what, that's what Christians do? There's a big difference. And Satan wants to tear you down and not let you hear this, that you are a child of God. You are an image bearer of the Father and you are full of the Holy Spirit. You are a warrior and God wants to use you as a tool to be for other people. Now, you and him are going to take care of your life and you're going to get through the things that you have to do. But if that was it, think of the value and the identity and the purpose that brings for your life. I'm not here just to survive and get my kids out of college and then move on and then die. We have a purpose. 
And Jesus gets it and understands because he came to be one of us. Hebrews 4 says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has, has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and he did not sin. I love that aspect of Jesus. He's never going to ask us to do something that he hasn't already done. Jesus understands what he's actually asking us to do or not do or give or give up because he knows how hard this world is and how broken this world is. And not from an up view reading a story, but by his own life experiences. He has been there. He has been here. He has lived and he has been broken and he has laughed and he has eaten and he has taught and he's been devastated and he's been overjoyed. He knows the feelings that you're going through. He is our example. And we can trust him because he's been one of us. What did he do then? How should we really live as Christians? Should we make a long list of demands on people? Well, one of his best friends, John, says this in chapter 13. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. The king of the world got down in his underwear in front of everybody at dinner and washed their feet. He put his clothes back on. He says, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher, rabbi, Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. But now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. Later on, it says this in verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I don't know how many times and how many ways I could say this. The churches are empty and declining and dying because the church doesn't believe that Christ is in them. And even if they believe Christ is in them, they're not using that to grow themselves to love the world. Because when Jesus shows up, lives are changed. And now I, Dave Fishback, am supposed to be Jesus. Not that I'm going to make it. But there should be people around me who are being changed. There should be people around you that are being changed because of the way you love them. How did he love them? Did he write nice cards and bake cookies? Will you be my Valentine? He humiliated himself. Humiliated. I don't know that type of love. I gotta be honest. I might humiliate myself to help out Caleb or Brooke or Becky. I might might so I'm learning myself but this should be your goal this should be my goal this should be our family's goal as a church because I want to say when the normal human in America adult or child looks at the church do they get this picture Do you think they think this is church? If you showed them this picture, I wish that was more clear. I'm sorry I didn't make that a little brighter. That is 50 people from 6 to 86 mashed together in a mosh pit, laughing, wrestling, smiling, being family. How do we take that from the safety of this room and create something down on Weber Street that maybe we call the hub? How do we take that vibe to your workplace? How do we take that vibe to your grandchildren? That's what Jesus wants. I hope that's one of your goals. Now I'm gonna shut up. 
I'm going to bring the band back up. But I want you to hear this. It starts with actually believing that Jesus Christ is inside of you. And for some of you, you need to make that decision today to get Christ inside of you. And you can do that. Maybe you just find that the for and the with you've always believed, but you didn't understand how he was one of you. And maybe that's starting to click. And it might not totally click until you just go ahead and make the leap of faith and let him in. Let him in. If you let him in, I promise you it'll be the best decision you've ever made if you take it seriously and find some other Christians in your life who will take it seriously as well. If we can care for one another, if we can love one another, if we can be generous, if we can actually hold each other accountable and change our identity from stupid Dave Fishback from Kentucky to warrior of God with his church family in Piqua, we will do incredible things because the God wants to do that. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this family. And sometimes